Um, so I'd just like to welcome you to um, our latest Norfolk Record Office event. And this is a fundraiser for the Norfolk Archives and Heritage Development Found and Foundation. And I'm going to introduce you to Peter Williams, who is the chair of the trustees, um, to just tell you a little bit about that before we start. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, and good afternoon to everybody. I don't want to get between the audience and the author. Um, because he's got a lot of interesting things to tell us. But I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes just explaining to you, those of you who don't know, what Nora is, what Nora does, and why we need a fundraiser. Nora was set up in 2016 as a response to a sudden appearance on the market of a large number of very important documents uh, with, uh, with respect to Norfolk. This was the Morning Thought Manor sale where the then owner, um, the late um, uh, uh, Mr. Fisk, um, decided to downsize his, his collection of archives. And um, at very short order, 30,000 pounds was raised, very short order, 30,000 pounds was raised so that the Norfolk Record Office could bid for these some of these documents. And there were some very important documents like the diaries of Horatio Walpole, and um, the memorial court records of Wells Next to Sea, um, and I um, uh, 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 can't remember the third one, which I thought was particularly significant. Um, that was very successful, but it could only be done because uh, there was a, an organization, a charity, which was empowered to buy documents in this way on behalf of the record office. The record office itself isn't empowered, isn't allowed to buy things. So, the, the, the charity Nora um, was set up to do that. And after the sale, which was very successful uh, and, uh, and, and um, uh, several hundred documents were, were bought, after that, um, Nora continued to develop, has continued to develop as a charitable incorporated organization, giving grants, not only to the record office to help it buy, um, uh, to, to buy uh, documents that come on the market, but also to support local um, archive organizations, local other, other organizations, which can benefit from interaction with the archives. So it's becoming slowly but surely, it's becoming a very significant organization in the whole world of Norfolk archives. It's one of the few ways in which the holdings of the record office can be increased. And I know that um, staff there are very, very careful to see what's around. And if necessary, to come to Nora and say, can you provide us some money? Of course, we can only do that if we have money to supply. We have no, we have no large um, independent source of money. And so we do, do rely on individuals and small organizations generally to provide us with money. Uh, in, the, um, in the foyer here, in the exhibition area here, you'll see a box, which um, is, if not full, which has some rather good uh, contributions in it. Um, so that's why we call this a fundraiser. We do hope that you will have um, followed up the request from the organisers to um, uh, provide us with uh, about five pounds each, at least, um, for the benefit of, of, of Nora. Um, and there is also a supporters association, um, supporters scheme, and there is a document uh, which is, I think, probably on our website or available from the record office, which explains how you can join that and support Nora in that way. So Nora is very pleased indeed this afternoon to be associated with this talk by Professor Joby um, on a topic which is of particular importance and interest to Norfolk and to Norwich. So without any further ado, um, I'll hand you back to Victoria who's going to introduce Chris. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, I just want to very quickly just go through a couple of admin points. So um, for those of you in the audience, um, can you hear me okay? Um, for those of you in the audience in person, Chris um, has very kindly agreed to answer any questions at the end of his talk. So please do feel free to pop your hand up at that point. If you are um, joining us online, please use the chat facility and you can ask any questions as you're going along and um, we will put them to Chris at the end as well. Um, the final thing is just to mention that this talk is being recorded. Chris was very kind to um, agree to it to be recorded and we'll go on to our YouTube channel at the end. So if you um, want to watch it again or if you have any friends or relatives who um, would like to watch it, please feel free to, to do that after the talk um, on YouTube. 
So um, just to introduce Chris, um, Christopher Joby was born and bred in Norwich. He was educated at Oxford and Durham and is currently a professor of Dutch in Poland. He has published books and articles on the intersection between the Dutch language and culture and other languages and cultures. He is currently working on a book on Dutch missionaries in the 17th century Taiwan. So I'll pass you straight over to Chris. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Victoria. Good afternoon to you uh, here in person uh, and those of you joining us uh, online. So today I want to talk to you about John Crusoe at the Norfolk Record Office. It is almost 10 years since uh, I last made a presentation at Norfolk Record Office. The occasion was a day conference on the Norfolk Strangers. Other presenters were John Alban and Frank Mears, who it's good to see he's here this afternoon, well known in these parts. Alistair Duke, Margaret Tofner and Peter Drudgill. I gave a paper on Dutch poetry in early modern Norfolk. One of the poets whom I mentioned was John Crusoe. Crusoe has stayed with me in the intervening years and I am now delighted to present my book on his life and work. And this is a copy of the book, perhaps you can uh, see that. Okay. Um, so in 1969, the French literary critic Michel Foucault wrote uh, a seminal paper, What is an Author? I think it is fair to say that although I am the named author, Foucault would want me to acknowledge that several other individuals have made vital contributions to the book. The scholars Alistair Duke, Matthew Woodcock, Ton Harmson, David Lawrence and Ismini Pels deserve special mention, but many others have also helped me. My editor, Elizabeth MacDonald at Boydell was always on hand to give constructive advice. Great to see you here this afternoon, Elizabeth. And I'm grateful to the many librarians uh, and archivists, including those at the NRO, who assisted me in accessing the hundreds of primary and secondary sources that I used to write the book. I consulted almost 60 documents in the NRO collection alone. So it is safe to say that without the NRO collection, I could not have written this book in anything like the final form. On the cover of his 1655 publication of Dutch epigrams, John Crusoe quotes the Roman poet Marshall, non intret carto teatrum meum, out si intraverit spectet. Do not let Cato enter my theatre, or if he does enter, let him look. Those of you here at the Norfolk Record Office and those watching the live stream are welcome to enter this theatre. There will be none of the scatological language and vulgarity of which Marshall warns, you may want to leave now, but perhaps a few of the harmless jests to which Marshall also refers. I'll begin this presentation by briefly placing Crusoe and his family in the broader context of migration in the early modern period, and more specifically, migration between the Low Countries and England. I'll then give an account of Crusoe's life and works, picking out some of the significant themes that I analyse in the book, including Crusoe's multilingualism, networking skills, the intertextuality in his literary works, and his identity formation. I shall then examine some of the manuscripts from the wonderful NRO collection relating to Crusoe. Migration is an important theme in my book. It would be easy to think of this as primarily a modern phenomenon, but of course it's always been with us. It is reckoned that in the early modern period, about a third of the people in Europe migrated either within or across national boundaries. Two main drivers of migration were religious persecution and economic necessity. After the Protestant Reformation uh, began in 1517, many Protestants were forced to leave Catholic countries and vice versa. Furthermore, although some polities became Protestant, certain Protestant minorities were persecuted or wanted to emigrate to practice their religion more freely. Economic need arose from crop failure, rural poverty, war or plague. Sometimes a combination of factors caused people to migrate. Looking specifically at migration from the Low Countries to England, in 1547, 
King Edward VI succeeded his father, Henry VIII, as King of England. Edward's regime vigorously supported the Protestant Reformation. One of his policies was to establish migrant churches, which would act as models for English Protestantism. In 1550, he permitted the establishment of a Dutch church at Austin Friars in London, which still functions to this day. And this is uh, the modern building. The older building was destroyed uh, in the Second World War. Protestant migrant communities and churches were established elsewhere in England and indeed Europe. Sandwich in Kent, close to the continent, had Dutch or Flemish and French speaking communities and churches. Colchester had a significant Dutch speaking population and large Dutch church. And four towns in Norfolk, Norwich, Yarmouth, Thetford and Lynn had Dutch churches, the last two albeit briefly. Many of the migrants in these communities worked in the textile trade and they contributed to the building up of this trade in England. As we shall see, John Crusoe and his family made their money from textiles. Finally, the strangers, as they were called locally, left their mark on the street names and areas of cities. The Norwich-born sociolinguist Peter Drudgill argues that plain, as in bank plain, comes from the Dutch plein, meaning square. So what of John Crusoe and his family? John's father, Jan, came from Onschot, which is now in France, close to the border with Belgium. It is in the historic county of Flanders, and Jan's first language was the Flemish dialect of Dutch. Probably for reasons of religious persecution and economic need, Jan left Onschot and arrived in Norwich with his wife, Jacoba, or Jane, at some point in the 1570s. They may have come directly to Norwich via Yarmouth or possibly via another stranger community, such as the one in Sandwich. Jan established himself as a leading member of the Dutch stranger community in Norwich, becoming a cloth merchant, church elder and militiaman. He had three sons, John, Jan, the subject of my book, Aquila, who became a Cambridge scholar and Anglican prelate, and Timothy, who became a merchant, a Dutch church deacon and a militiaman in London. One of Timothy's sons was called Timothy, and one of his sons was called Timothy. This Timothy, John's great nephew, studied alongside Daniel Defoe at the Dissenters Academy in Newington Green, London, before becoming a noted Presbyterian preacher. It is this connection that would etch the name of Crusoe in eternity, as it prompted Defoe to give this unusual name to the main character in his 1719 novel, The Life and Strange Surprising Adventures of Robinson Crusoe of York. John was baptized in February 1593 or 1592 in Old Money in St. George's Colgate in the great ward of Ultra Aquam to the north of the River Wensum, where many of the stranger families had settled. We'll return later to the document in which his baptism is recorded. We know little about John's early life. He probably attended Norwich Free Grammar School in the Cathedral Close. I say probably because the relevant school records no longer exist. Nevertheless, he clearly had a classical humanist education, for his literary works are drenched in references to the classical and Renaissance texts that were the staple of such an education. After school, he spent time in London before settling in the parish of St. Andrew in Norwich and then moving to St. Peter Mancroft as he accrued wealth as a cloth merchant and hosier. Like his father, he became an elder at the Dutch church at Blackfriars Hall and a militia captain. He and his wife, Rebecca, had several children, one of whom, John Jr., studied at Gonville and Keys, Cambridge, before becoming a scholar and Anglican prelate. Crusoe published his first verse in 1622. It was a Dutch elegy on Simeon Routink. Routink had been born in the stranger community in Norwich and was, was minister of the Dutch church in London for some 20 years. To mark Routink's passing in 1621, Anglo-Dutch and Dutch poets, including Constantine Huygens and Jacob Katz, and John's brother Aquila, 
contributed to a collection of 26 Latin and Dutch elegies. This was published in Leiden by Isaac Elsevier and is what I describe as the most important Anglo-Dutch literary moment in the 17th century. The theme of Crusoe's verse that we can see here on uh, the left is the power of the poet and his desire to immortalize Routink's name. In 1642, Crusoe published two Dutch verses. One was an amplificatio or expansion on Psalm 8, a paean to God's creation. It runs to some 1400 lines of Dutch Alexandrians and was his most technically accomplished and erudite verse. There is one reference to Norwich, which is here and runs. Ja, de weilig dit beschrijf en in de groene dalen langs jeri koele stroom ik ga een luchtje halen en keren naar de stad de dichte bosgen door. Hoe word ik daar onthaald door nachtegalen goor? Which in English means, and whilst I write this, and in the green valleys by the year's cool stream, I take in a breath of air and return to the city through the thick woods. And I am entertained, oh how, by the choir of nightingales. The banks of the River Yare, which flows to the south of Norwich, functioned in some sense as Crusoe's locus aminus, or happy place, away from Norwich's smoky hearths. The second Dutch verse that Crusoe published in 1642 was an elegy on the minister of the Dutch church, Johannes Ellison. This was again written in Dutch Alexandrians or iambic hexameters. Ellison, who was born in the Norwich Dutch stranger community, had been a minister for 36 years. Crusoe had grown up listening to his sermons and worked alongside him as an elder for 12 years. The elegy uh, attests to the respect that Crusoe had for Ellison. Although he recognizes the great loss Ellison's passing had brought about, he takes comfort from the fact that he had been replaced by Ellison's son, Theophilus, who had been minister in Norwich for many years after his father's death. There are monuments to both Johannes and Theophilus Ellison in Blackfriars Hall, where the Dutch church met for worship. Ellison gained immortality not only in print, but also in paint. His eldest son, called unsurprisingly Johannes, had moved to Amsterdam, where he had made his fortune as a merchant. In 1634, he invited his parents, Johannes Ellison and Maria Bocanola, to take the boat to Holland to get their portraits painted by the up-and-coming portrait artist Rembrandt van Rijn. The portraits were in a private collection in Norfolk for many years before being sold to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, where they now hang. They're the only portraits of people living in England by Rembrandt. Crusoe's final flourish as a Dutch poet came in 1655, when he published a collection of 221 Dutch epigrams. He gave the collection the title Epigrammata of the Winteravonds Tijdkorting, epigrams or pastimes for a winter's evening, suggesting he only penned the verses when he had a few moments in Norwich's long, cold winter evenings. Remember those? As often, Crusoe does not give his full name on the title page, but only his initials. On the one surviving copy in the British Library, someone has made the C into an O with a pen. Two of the epigrams reference Norwich, leaving us in little doubt that Crusoe is their author. And they are epigrams 53 and uh, 145. Epigram 53 concerns the journey that two Dutchmen, or Flemings, Klaas and Jan, made from London to Norwich, or Noordewijk. Klaas is clearly cleverer than Jan, for he tricks his travelling companion into carrying his coat for him for most of the journey. We see the name of Noordewijk there in line two. Epigram 145 concerns a portrait of Johannes Ellison, though not the one by Rembrandt. Like many of Crusoe's epigrams, it was based on an earlier verse, 
in this case, a Latin quatrain by Theodore Bazaar on a picture of Erasmus by Holbein. The point is that the portrait only depicts half of Ellison down to his waist. Why? Because he's too great for the world, let alone a portrait to contain all of him. Turning now to Crusoe's military works, he used his many years of experience as a militiaman, his classical education, and his knowledge of French and Dutch to write five books on military matters, which helped to inform and shape the English civil wars. In 1632, he published the first book in English devoted to the cavalry, military instructions for the cavalry. This was republished in 1644. In 1639 and 1640, he published translations from French of two military works, The Art of War and The Complete Captain. The latter includes an abridgment of Caesar's Gallic Wars, which Crusoe would have read at Norwich School. In 1642, he published The Order of Military Watches and Castrumitation, both military handbooks for army officers. Castrumitation, on how to set an, out an army camp, includes a translation from a Dutch work by Simon Stavin. In this translation, and the two from French, Crusoe acted as a cultural go-between. One theme that the book explores extensively is how Crusoe operationalized his multilingualism. I just mentioned how he used his knowledge of French and Dutch, and of course, English. Norwich School armed him with a knowledge of Latin and Greek. Latin in particular allowed him to read many classical and Renaissance sources for his military works and poetry. Greek was useful for reading the New Testament as well as pagan classical authors, although he may have read Latin translations of their works. Other vernacular languages which Crusoe could probably read included German and Italian. Intertextuality is another theme that I explore in this book. Crusoe's military works are replete with references to classical and Renaissance authors. In the early modern period, it was not so important for the poet to be, as it were, entirely original. Rather, praise was garnered by taking existing texts and reworking them in a new way, typically referred to as imitatio. Crusoe's headmaster at Norwich School, Richard Briggs, was a friend of Ben Jonson. To quote Johnson, in his verse, Crusoe did not imitate servilely, as Horace saith, but drew from the best and choicest of classical and Renaissance verse, and with a range of rhetorical transformations, turned it into sweet honey, above all Dutch honey. Crusoe was an accomplished networker. One of his networks could be described as Anglo-Dutch. This included leaders of the Dutch or Flemish communities in England, such as Routink and the Ellisons, and Jan Prost, the minister in Colchester for many years. Crusoe gave Prost a signed copy of his first published military work. Crusoe also built up an extensive English network. This included poet prelates, such as Ralph Nevert, who wrote a verse in praise of Crusoe, and Lawrence Howlett, Howlett was the minister of St. Andrews in Norwich for several years until his death in 1626. Crusoe wrote three elegies on, How on Howlett, which I analyze in detail in the book. Crusoe's military network was also extensive. It included Philip Skippon, whom Ismini Pels, in her recent biography of Skippon, another Norfolk man born and bred, describes as the third most senior general in Parliament's new model army after Cromwell and Fairfax. Much of the information that we have about Crusoe's social and literary network comes from the front matter of his published works, the paratexts, to use a term associated with the French literary critic, Gérard Jeunette. Crusoe dedicated military instructions for the cavalry to Thomas Howard, 14th Earl of Arundel and 4th Earl of Surrey. He was a renowned art collector and prominent courtier, as this portrait by Rubens suggests. He was also Earl Marshal of England and Lord Lieutenant of His Majesty's forces in Norfolk and Norwich. We cannot know precisely how well Crusoe knew Arundel. 
on the one hand, he may have been an idealized patron, far removed from his own social circle. But on the other hand, Crusoe may have met him at the annual musters of the Norwich militias. Either way, dedicating his book to Arundel shows that Crusoe was adept at social positioning and indeed could be described as a social aspirer. One other theme that the book analyzes is identity. In the modern discourse on identity, one term that has emerged is hybrid identity. This is an identity which attempts to link to or acknowledge the past in the light of a different cultural environment. In Crusoe's case, he was born and lived in England, but continued to acknowledge the past of his Flemish or more broadly Netherlandish heritage. This allowed him to write in Dutch and English, to be an English gentleman, but also a Dutch church elder and Dutch stranger militiaman. In the remainder of this presentation, I want to focus on several documents in the NRO collection, which I reference in the book. NCR 16A13, the Mayor's Court Book. This includes the only record that we have of the birth of John Crusoe Senior, our John Crusoe, and his siblings. Previously, working back from other sources, we could only date his birth to before 1595. This entry in the Mayor's Court Book tells us John was baptised on the 16th of February 1592, i.e. 1593. And this arrow is pointing to uh, the line where his baptism is recorded. The entry was transcribed from a document presented to the mayor's court by John's father, Jan. In the book, I discuss possible reasons why Jan presented this document and why the baptisms were recorded in the mayor's court book in 1601. NCR 16C3, 1566 Ordinances of Norwich School. As I've suggested, Crusoe probably attended Norwich Free Grammar School in the Cathedral Close. The grammar school was governed by the city corporation. The 1566 ordinances for the Free Grammar School were part of a general reformation of the city's ordinances. An 18th century copy, possibly made by the town clerk, is also in the NRO collection. Here we can see the works that pupils would study. They were, for the most part, classical authors. Poets included Virgil, Ovid, Horace, Juvenal, and Perseus. They also studied grammars by Renaissance authors such as Thomas Linnecker's De Figuris, Linnecker was Mary Tudor's tutor, Rudolf Walter's De Syllabarum et Carminum Ratione Libri Duo, and Erasmus's De Copia. Greek was also on the syllabus for the upper forms. Aesop's Fables, the New Testament, and Lucian's Dialogues were three of the Greek texts that Crusoe cum suis read. And here's a list of the Greek texts that they studied. MC 61936783X2. The NRO includes printed editions of manuscripts that cannot currently be traced. One example is the baptismal records for the Dutch church in Norwich. By 1617, John and his wife Rebecca were living in the parish of St Andrews in central Norwich. This collection of baptismal records in Dutch compiled by C.H.E. White tells us that in January 1617, John and Rebecca had their first child, a daughter, Anna. And here's the name of Anna Crusoe. The witnesses included John's parents, Jan and Jane, or Jacoba, and Daniel Boscha from London, possibly a family friend. Reference to Jan tells us that he was still alive at this date, which is important, as we do not have any other evidence for the date of his death. Militia Lists 1, NCR 13A, 12-2. The NRO has preserved many of the muster lists of Norwich militias. 
Militias had been introduced in London in 1572 and the rest of England in 1573 to address the threat of possible foreign invasions as well as Catholic insurgency. Jan Crusoe, John's father, was a militiaman, as was John. Jan belonged to the Dutch stranger militia and had a caliver, a kind of arquebus. He appeared in a muster list in 1595-6 and would continue to appear in the lists until at least 1616. Militia lists two, NCR 13A 18. In 1616, Jan's name appears alongside that of his eldest son, John. Jan, John Crusoe Senior, is listed under the corselets. Oh, sorry. Button there. Okay, there we go. John Crusoe listed uh, under the corselets, whilst John, John Crusoe Jr., is listed under the muskets. Militia lists three, NCR 13A 29. Eleven years later, John is the captain of the Dutch militia. He would later be captain of the joint Dutch and Walloon militia. He used his experience as a militiaman to write the military books I mentioned earlier. His lieutenant in 1627 was a member of another prominent stranger merchant family, Tobias de Hem. There is a monument to his father, Jacques, in the church of St. Michael at Plea in Norwich. NCR 18A 13, Chamberlain's accounts. Some references in the sources leave us with more questions than answers. The first published work by Crusoe, of which we know for certain, was Military Instructions for the Cavalry, published in 1632. However, in the Chamberlain's accounts for 1626-7, there is an entry under Payments in General, which reads, item to Mr. Crusoe for a military book, two shillings. Is this merely a book that Crusoe had obtained for the corporation, or is it a copy of a book that he had written? We don't know, but it is certainly worth noting. Matthew Woodcock was kind enough to bring this to my attention. PD 2671, Church Warden's Accounts for St. Peter Mancroft. Since about 1632, John and his family had been living in the wealthiest parish in Norwich, St. Peter Mancroft. This slide illustrates that he paid an Easter rate of one pound in 1648. Other rates, as low as three shillings and four pence and five shillings, illustrate that John was paying one of the highest rates. He'd been successful as a merchant and hosier and as an author. However, in 1649, we no longer find John's name in the accounts. Instead, his son Aquila is listed as paying an Easter rate of 10 shillings. Aquila had become a free man and therefore probably assumed the running of his father's hosiery and cloth business. The change in names in the church warden's accounts may simply reflect the fact that John had passed the title deeds of his house to his son Aquila. Or perhaps John had moved house. Court documents from this period named John and Aquila on opposite sides of a financial dispute. So there were clearly problems in the Crusoe household. For the final document, we go to the British Library Collection, MS3, uh, sorry, MS43862 is a minute book of the weekly meetings of the political men, Politica Manor in Dutch, Homme Politique in French, between 1605 and 1615. These officials, elected annually, were responsible for keeping order in the stranger communities, and acting as a bridge between the stranger communities and the Norwich civic authorities. Occasionally, they, had, they held extraordinary meetings. This happened in September 1608, because John's father, Jan, had been a very naughty boy. He had falsified seals for the cloth produced by the city's weavers. And here is an English translation of the relevant Dutch text in the minute book. 8th September Extraordinary Meeting. The political manner 
who have found that Jan Crusoe has committed an offence against the trading community and harmed it significantly by attaching counterfeit say seals to send the same, i.e. the says, to London. Wanting to protect the honour of the community and attempting to resolve all these matters quietly and properly, the governors and the political manner have finally decided that to make good the situation, Jan Crusoe shall first hand over to the governors of the same say trade all the counterfeit seals that he had made for this purpose. Jan was a church elder, and so this probably brought him into disrepute in the stranger community. He later paid a fine and the matter was considered closed. However, as the text suggests, it was vital for the strangers that the English authorities did not get wind of it. Similar cases on the continent had led to the culprits being executed. This brings us to the end of our odyssey through the life and works of John Crusoe of Norwich. Whilst Crusoe did not perhaps reach the literary and career heights of a contemporary inhabitant of Norwich, Sir Thomas Brown, he nevertheless achieved many things in his life. He was a part of familias, a merchant, a poet, a military author, a translator, a church elder, and a militia captain. He was a polyglot, an adept networker, and financially successful, living in a large house in the parish of St. Peter Mancroft. As Diane Perkis notes, what all history needs is the stories of the people who lived it. I hope that my book on the life and work of John Crusoe is a suitable response to Perkis's plea. Whether or not it is, of course, is for others to judge. Thank you.